Welcome to It's Your Date with Destiny with Apostle Vivian and Pastor Gemma Duncan of Divine Destiny Worship Center in Diego Martin. For the next 30 minutes, join us as we take you on a journey of maximizing your potential and realizing your goals through Jesus Christ. Why is it when you need a miracle, it doesn't happen, but when you least expect it, it happens? You are married. You have challenges in your relationship, but your spouse is unwilling to accede to any counseling. Is divorce an option? I'm no How does a parent handle a promiscuous child? What are considered the do's and, and do's of a born-again couple who is not yet married? There are always more questions than answers. That so here is Apostle Gemma. Grace and peace to you. In the event that you are first-time viewer, my name is Gemma Duncan. I'm married to Apostle Vivian Duncan, and uh, together we pass the Divine Destiny Worship Center. Our headquarters is located in Digo Martin on the Digo Martin Main Road, opposite Southernx Drive in Trinidad. We have branches in Sangre Grande, in uh, Faisabad, in Chaguanas. We have a branch in Rio Claro, one in Tobago, and a branch in Antigua in the event that they have a friend or a family member there. Due to COVID restrictions, we've gone totally online again. So our Sunday morning service is 9 a.m. And uh, our weekly services, Thursdays and Fridays, 7 p.m. You can find us at ddwc.tv or on Facebook. Remember that our offices are still open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. And the business center is also open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday. Just remember, you can hear me on Isaac 98.1 as Pastor Gemma Radio every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. And then I want to invite all pastor's children to join our daughter Jade Patrice in her ministry offering, the pkconnection.com. Last time we met, we were um, responding to a question. And it reads, my husband and I have led separate lives by mutual consent. How do I go about mending our relationship? And so now I have to give you a quick overview. Here is somebody who lived the separate lives. You know, they were separated, um, except that they remained in the same house. At this point in time, the wife now wants to mend the relationship. It's one-sided. There has been no discussion with the husband concerning mending the relationship and so i'm dealing with the wife from that point of view um firstly i encourage her to get a counselor and i would prefer somebody with a bible background in addition to their professional qualifications and i feel that that person will bring balance to the process because um, we want to go according to script here um since reconciliation is her idea, then for the moment, she will have to do the counseling by herself until we could get her husband to come on board. It's very important that she be truthful and honest with the counselor because that's the only way that the process will work. And it's going to be an uphill climb, a bit discouraging, but I encouraged her to stay with the process. Now, along with that, side of the professional counseling, I also gave my little TV advice because all of us know that something like that, any kind of a uh, relationship breakup or uh, resolution or any such thing can be solved from uh, a few minutes on television. And I used what I call the Esther model. The Esther model is taken from the book of Esther in the Bible, where Esther was uh, confronted with a situation that could have caused her death and the death of her people, the Jews. And uh, she had no choice but to petition her husband, the king. One would have thought that that would have been an easy thing to do because that's your husband. But there was a rule 
that nobody could approach the king, wife or not, without him coming to you first. So he had to initiate the approach. And based on the Bible, it was a whole month that he did not even come to visit Esther. And so she could not approach him by law. And if you do approach him, he had to extend his um, scepter, his golden scepter to you. If the scepter was not extended, then you would be put to death. And uh, Esther uh, did a few things and it worked for her. She was able to see him, he held out the scepter and uh, she saved herself and uh, her people. And uh, I have used this model in terms of relationship, uh, male, female relationship, husband, wife relationship, and it has worked. And so I am going to suggest to this lady to begin the process by praying and fasting. Of course, ask God in the prayer time to help you choose the correct counselor, which is absolutely important. And he's going to guide you along in terms of a choice of counselor. I suggested that she included at least one person or two for the most to join her in prayer and fasting. When you're going through certain things and you reach like roadblocks, uh, dead end streets uh, in the process, you really need somebody to talk to. Just a listening ear is important. Sometimes the person doesn't have to counsel you as such. I've had that. People just want to vent, as we say, and they don't really need you to tell them anything. Then, as Esther did, Esther, the Bible says, put on her royal apparel, and so I suggested a complete physical makeover, if that is at all possible for the lady. Um, so concentrate on her hair, face, clothing, and all of that. And having lived with your husband for a while, you will know how he likes to see you. You know, sometimes we don't always dress the way our husbands like to see us. He may like hair in one particular way, and you like your hair one way. But this time, if you want to mend that relationship, then you'll have to uh, try to appeal to him by um, looking how he like you to look. So revisit that, right? Then the next step that Esther took was food. When finally she got a chance to petition her husband, she didn't tell him what the problem was initially. She just said to him, I just came because I want to invite you to a banquet that I've prepared for you. And uh, that was uh, the way that she got to his heart through his stomach, the old people say. And uh, um, it worked out for her. She was able to save herself and her people. Uh, and so the Esther model, remember three things. You go to God, include God, put God first in the whole process. Then do something about your physical appearance. Of course, we know um, perhaps he hasn't been looking at you. But if you start to change and look a certain way, you're all in the same house and he will notice. And that will kind of pique his interest. Why is she dressing up now? Why is she looking a little different. Why is she looking like that even at home? You know what I mean? And then uh, food. So we talked about food and I, I don't know um, if that person will eat from you, but a good thing would be to fix um, certain meals that you know that he loved or still love and uh, fix it while he's at home so he will get the smell. And uh, he may even come out and say, you know what I mean? You're cooking so and so and so and you could offer him some food from time to time that could soften him up. Um, so that's where we left off last time. And today we want to look at a hiccup that could happen in this whole thing. It seems going good up to now. And hopefully uh, the husband is softening towards the wife. And we've seen that happen. Uh, it reached that stage and, you know, they started to talk. And he even reached the stage where um, he wants to come to counseling as well. Some refuse, but some people say, yes, let's see how we could make a go at um, reconciliation. And then we come to a mountain. And uh, um, this mountain is a third party. Because you had both agreed to live separate lives by mutual consent, then either of you could have had a third party relationship. And it was no offensive to anybody because he was living his life, you were living yours. Now you want to uh, reconcile. Remember, he may have had 
somebody as well. Now, um, some couples are very discreet, and if there is a third party, um, they kind of keep the third person private. You know, it, that person is not brought to the house, and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, um, and so uh, that's something that, uh, that's a conversation that we may have to come up. In the event that there is a third party, and there often is, um, I am going to tell you some of the things that my mother taught me. She's now deceased. And looking back, I would consider her a sage. And uh, she always said to me, in the event that there's a third party relationship, you have to leave it up to God and your husband to fix. In other words, you don't really want to get involved with the third party. So here are some don'ts. You want to start off with some don'ts. Do not approach the other woman. Don't approach the other woman. Remember, my mother used to say, if in any event, if there is some third person hanging around in any form, that leave it up to God and your husband. So of course, we go to God first, and he will give you strategy. And then let your husband handle that um, person. Remember, you're talking about where you've reached the point where he, you all are talking, probably reach the stage where he's willing to go for counseling and considering reconciliation. Then you have to leave him to treat with the third party. Even when that person initiates communication with you, do not take bait. So that person will try to call you on the phone, text you, or whatever. Don't take bait. There is something called delete. You know, there you have no conversation with that person, no communication whatsoever. Don't entertain public exchange of words, even if you happen to meet. And so there are times when you may meet in a particular place and uh, it wasn't planned. And uh, the possibility exists that there may be some comment being dropped. Um, don't respond. You need to just move away from that situation, you know, just get away from that, that situation if possible. If it's in a, um, like, a, let's say, a party or some event, I would kind of quickly go to the bathroom or something like that, just disappear very readily and then decide if you need to leave the event or what you need to do. But please do not um, uh, entertain any kind of public exchange of words. Uh, this is a big no-no. No chick fights, please. Don't lower yourself to publicly have a fight with somebody that your husband would have been involved in. Remember, um, you will agree to live separate lives. And even if you did not agree to live separate lives, your husband is the one who made the decision to have a relationship with the person. And so the person you need to communicate with at all times is your husband and not the individual. I remember um, an incident where um, this wife uh, met the person in the bank. So she didn't intend to create any situation. And she met the person in the bank and for some reason um, decided to uh, approach the individual and to have some um, communication. For want of a better word, it wasn't communication. Some words were said. And it uh, ended up where the wife initiated what we call a chick fight and she got herself beaten the other person beat her to a pulp now you don't initiate a fight if you can't fight as a matter of fact don't initiate fights at all we're not doing that we're not going there you know and that's one of the things my mother warned me she said there must be no public display of any displeasure any situation that you may have with Vivian none when you go out in public, behave as if everything is perfect. Nobody on the outside must have an inkling that you're fighting like two man rat inside the house, except somebody who is a neighbor and they're hearing you and you're trying to keep it down if at all possible. So that's a no-no. Uh, it was very embarrassing. Uh, the, the two parties lived and worked in a certain area which was small, so... Everybody in the bank was known to them, to both of them. And the people probably were aware of the situation already. So it turned out to be a, a big scandal that everybody knew and talked about, right? So we, we want to avoid that. 
again, I want to quote my mother, never show your hand in public. Now, I am not a card player. You know, what they, they were very strict. I don't know why we didn't play cards. They didn't allow me to play cards as children. And so I never learned how to play cards. And, but I understand that certain card games that you play, you have to keep your hand close to you. Don't let the other people see your hand. And so one of the things that you, you, you mustn't do is when you deal with like an outside woman, don't play your hand. That person, even when they see you or their friends meet you or something, so there must not be any evidence that there is any kind of uh, weakness or chink in the relationship. Every time you come out, and especially if you and your husband come out together, I mean, you're looking like everything is hunky-dory. I mean, you know, so uh, my mother would say, you're holding hands and you're touching him ever so often, you're leaning into him, you know, you're smiling and so on. All right, I know we is a bit of pretense and all that, but even so, you know, you're playing it to the hilt because you're in public. When you go inside, let's deal with some of the issues that we have. So don't show your hand in public. All negative emotions must be expressed in private. So you see the person, the anger and the hurt and the hatred rises up in you again. You walk away from the situation, jump in your car, try to control yourself because you're driving. When you get home, you go in the bathroom uh, and ball, you know, and you and God have a conversation. Again, if you feel overwhelmed and you can get your counselor, get the counselor, or remember you have this prayer partner, call the person and vent, get the feelings out to you. But we don't want any kind of public display at all. And you may be saying, well, um, the amount of things you're telling me I can't do, is there anything that I can do? And yes, I could tell you, there are many things that you can do. You can forgive, you can forgive, you can forgive. You have to forgive the, your husband. You have to forgive the person. You don't know how the whole thing started. We're not sure. But forgive, forgive, forgive. Why would I suggest forgiveness at the top of the list? is because you have to concentrate on God as you amp up your prayer when you have these situations to deal with. And if you want God on your side, then you have to keep away from hatred and purge yourself from bitterness and unforgiveness and all of that. If God has to work for you, you can't have these negative emotions. And that is what the Bible demands of us. Now, you know, it's hard to do. So you have to forgive, you have to forgive, you have to forgive. And every time you feel tempted to do something to respond or react in a negative way, go back to the drawing board, forgive, vent with your, your friend or your counselor, and then put on your happy face and go out and function. Again, um, I said to you, leave the outside woman entirely to your husband. Now, I have known where the relationship has, has reached the stage where um, the husband agreed to come home. He, um, you know, would want to work on his relationship. He went back his family and you all are working along. So you agreed. And that is when you can have some kind of input as to the parameters of the relationship. In other words, you will say, this is what I demand. And one of the things that you must insist on, when your husband decides that he wants to make a go at reconciliation, he must cut off all communication with the outside party. And I mean all. No dates, no phone calls, no texting. And I have known of couples who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not involved with that person, but I want to remain friends. Then that's a stalemate in the negotiations. He or she, neither of you could have your cake and eat it. If you want to remain friends with the person, we can't go further with this reconciliation process. You have to cut all ties because we don't know what friends mean. And because if you allow that situation to, to take place, then you're giving way for your husband to continue being with you and still having somebody else. Or maybe it could be vice versa. I want to close with a little story. This couple separated for many years. And uh, eventually the husband left the home and went to live with this third party. After a while, the wife became very comfortable living by herself. She was uh, a traditional, what I call servant wife, where we waited on our husband's hands and feet. And that's what we were taught um, in the country. When I grew up, a good wife literally waited on your husband. And I thought that that was, wow, if you did that, then that 
um, is, would help to have a successful relationship. You know, you cook, you clean. I mean, everything was all right. Uh, the clothes were ironed. Everything was fixed. I mean, the house was immaculate and so on. I mean, you literally sewed. Right? And they, they made us feel if you did that, then that would have satisfied them. And it took me a while to realize that not really. You know, I mean, probably appreciated all the nice things that were done, but didn't make him love me anymore because of the things that we would have done. And so she was that kind of a wife, and he still left her and went with somebody. Um, usually it's a younger version who probably wouldn't do any of those things. The person, sometimes they can't cook, <laughs> they don't wash, they don't clean, or anything so. And uh, um, the person will leave for that version. Now, um, there may be other factors involved, so that's, and you know, I'm not, I don't want to go there. But the, after a while, the wife got over it. She was financially independent. She was real happy. She didn't have to wait on them hands and feet. She, feet. she felt free to be herself, to do what she wanted, when she wanted, and so on. And uh, she uh, had a job. She was involved in church. She had a real good support system in the church. She was loved and appreciated. Life was good. And then one of her mentors, somebody from church, came to her and told her God wanted her to be reconciled with her husband. Of course, she refused. She said, no way, not at all. However, the mentor, who was somebody she respected, went ahead behind her back and spoke to him. He agreed. And finally, um, the mentor um, sort of planned a, 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 a time when they would meet with all the wife's knowledge, right? Uh, making a long story short, um, she agreed eventually to start the constant uh, process and he moved back home. Now, this other woman didn't give up at all. I'm just telling you that sometimes you can have that kind of a situation. The wife would drop off her husband to his job on her way to her job daily. And she told me for almost six months, every morning, when she dropped off the husband, the lady was standing in front of the workplace outside the, the, the building. And his wife would drop him off, didn't wait to see what he was doing, and she would drive away and go to work. Some women now will park somewhere and, you know, try to tack back to see and so on. And she said, I never, you know, I decided I'm not going there. And for oh, six long months, every day, that lady came and stood outside. The wife never knew what happened. Did he talk to her? We never knew. However, in the end, the couple lived a fruitful life, enjoying family for many years. And they actually grew old together. So I'm saying to you, um, as we close, that it's not impossible. If at any time, and I mean, I have many of these stories of people who migrated. Husband went away for years and separated and everything, and they ended up living to old age happily ever after. There are such stories, and I'm saying to you as we close this segment that uh, if you really believe that you want reconciliation in your marriage, then God is on your side. And my prayer for you is that uh, you both will live happily ever after. God bless you real good, and I hope I really helped you with this little discussion. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Mm -hmm. I lift my hands 
can This is Pastor Donald Duncan of The Body Church and I'm excited to share with you my brand new book, The Mystery of Time, Understanding the Time and Season You Are In. God has fit time into the continuum of eternity in such a way that it governs the human experience. In this, my seventh book, I look from seven different perspectives at the age-old question, what is time? I provide scriptural best practices for discerning God's timing and share effective tools for understanding the end times. Most importantly, I reveal through the life of Jesus the value of living according to God's schedule and tapping into the wisdom of the Holy Spirit for a revelation of the future. Pick up your copy today. You won't regret it. Available now at Amazon.com. I don't want you to ever forget what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. God bless you again.